Hello and welcome to another episode of COVID-19 Right Now from the Yale School of Public Health. I am James Hamblin. I'm a lecturer at the school and I'm fortunate to be joined today by Sten Vermund. He's the Dean of the school and by Mayor Desai. He's an Associate Professor of Epidemiology. They both have uh, long uh, introductions I could give of all the accomplishments and all the things that they have studied and are working on currently, but I will leave it at that um, and get right into the conversation. Um, I normally start by asking what is the, uh, what's on the front of your mind this week? And I think for all of us this week, we have something similar on the front of our mind. We are living through a um, historic moment of civil unrest, uh, protests across the nation over uh, police violence and the nature of policing and incarceration uh, and racism as a public health issue during a pandemic. Um, and so as if there were, uh, the public health community was not already in, in, engaged enough and um, everything seems to be coming together at once. Um, and can I, can I start with you, Sten, on uh, just broadly, I know the Yale School of Public Health has made, uh, has been active in, in responding to this and putting out statements and Yale University at large. Um, uh, how do you think the public health community is, is doing in its, in its response to this critical moment? There has been a drumbeat of um, reminder of structural racism in our country for my entire adult life. Um, I was a teenager um, and uh, younger in the 60s. Uh, and um, there is no question that we have made less progress than any of us would have thought um, around issues of um, police brutality, vig self-appointed vigilantes who look more like lynchers, and, um, and um, uh, violations of um, basic civil and human rights in a society that uh, criticizes other societies for those uh, offenses. And I think what was different about George Floyd in, in Minneapolis was eight minutes of watching a police officer murder someone. Um, that, that, that was so stark. Uh, you, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't sort of just see a gunshot move on. It was, it was just the, the, the raw murder of, 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 a, of, of a human being. And, uh, there's a point, there's a breaking point. Um, the, the, the reality is that, uh, we have been sickened by, the murder of the jogger in Atlanta, the murder of the young woman at home in her own home watching TV at midnight in Louisville, and now this. So there is a sense that um, police violence and police murder is actually a public health problem in the US, and I'm not sure we've looked at it quite that way, but in our social justice curriculum, in the school, um, uh, we have a core course in the, with that topic, um, with a town hall that we'll be having later this month that uh, Mayor, as a associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion, will be uh, leading. Um, we are going to do a top to bottom curriculum review and try to assess um, our research portfolios and see if we can get to this as a fundamental underlying problem. It's almost like um, mitigation of an environmental toxin versus uh, eliminating the toxin from getting into the environment to begin with. We have to back up our, um, our uh, social determinants of disease conversation to look at fundamental root causes. Can I throw to you, Mayor, for uh, responses to the moment and responses to what Stan just said? Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Those are, uh, you know, the, the, the events of the last week, the last few weeks, the last months have put into stark relief these issues of structural racism, um, white supremacy that are impacting us in so many ways. And we're seeing that play out in 
the COVID-19 pandemic we're seeing that uh, on our city streets uh, in response to uh, the actions of police around the country. And so this is uh, absolutely critical. Uh, you asked uh, initially uh, what are some of the things that one worries about or that worried about. Actually, I think the, the, there's a confluence of, of events now. We're going into the summertime. People are itching to get out. States are starting to uh, have phased reopenings. We see people on the streets across the country demonstrating. And I certainly worry about the potential for uh, a spike in cases. Uh, and deaths, and that will disproportionately continue to affect brown and black communities even more so. And so um, I, I think uh, there's uh, uh, more challenge ahead. Right. To, to that point, a question that I've been hearing, and, and I understand you both have as well, the idea about demonstrating an activism in this moment there are obviously competing interests where one could say that, that there's such a threat uh, that it, it would be dangerous not to demonstrate right now. People need to take to the streets because of this you know, public health um, crisis that we've seen you know, in these videos and these incidents and these disparities. Um, but there's also the pandemic. So I think a lot of people are trying to thread that needle of not, you know, not of, of preventing transmission, undue transmission while taking part in some way and making their beliefs and voices heard. Um, Sten, do you have um, general advice or guidelines on how, to, how people could navigate that scenario? You phrased it very well, James. Uh, the reality is that uh, people want their voices to be heard uh, they want to speak truth to power, and they want to uh, take to the streets in um, a 300-year uh, tradition of American uh, freedom to protest. Um, it's unfortunate that the backdrop is a viral pandemic, uh, and uh, we all know the rubric, um, physical distancing, uh, hand and face hygiene, um, mask use, and uh, avoidance of crowds and unnecessary, unnecessary travel. So a protest, you're probably not able to adhere to hardly any of that. Um, the masks were not being worn with great deal of fidelity, judging from the newspaper uh, and uh, media accounts. Um, physical distancing is almost an oxymoron when you're talking about a protest. And the uh, reality of um, hand hygiene is theoretical, uh, especially when you are uh, being tear gassed and, uh, and you are in severe um, pain in your eyes and you're trying to flush your eyes and it's just and then avoidance of crowds, you know, by definition, you're in a crowd. So I was not, as a public health professional, pleased to see these crowds, many of, peop many of whom were not wearing masks. Many, you know, I didn't see the hand hygiene practicalities and the physical distancing wasn't happening. So you were sort of batting 0 for 4. Um, whether we see coronavirus spread as a direct consequence of the protests, we do not know, but it's plausible uh, since we saw it in uh, churches and, you know, music events and the like. Uh, we do have the out great outdoors uh, going for us. So the protests were outdoors and uh, that uh, is highly facilitative of dispersion of droplet and aerosol. So asymptomatic individuals in the crowd or people who shouldn't have been there were symptomatic and went anyway. Uh, it may be that less damage is done as a consequence of the outdoor venue. And that's what we're hoping. Yeah, um, I should note that in New York, uh, and I go because uh, in a journalistic capacity as an observer, but I've been trying to witness as much of this as, as possible until the curfew hits and the masks are being used really, really well. There's a lot of, I mean, um, a lot of people 
doing really well with that. And a lot of people serving on the periphery kind of handing out water bottles or masks yeah. to people who don't want to get near the crowd, but want to contribute in some yeah. way. Um, well, you know, uh, uh, you're bringing up an important point, which is that um, over 40% of all the cases and over 50% of all the deaths were in five states. And, uh, and those states only represent about 14% of the U.S. population. So I do think that these five states in the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, these five states do have a, a, an acute consciousness of just what the stakes are because the burden of disease was so much greater in our part of the country than elsewhere. We truly were the global epicenter, and in some ways we still are. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, what you observed. Um, yeah, um, and at the same time, I'm seeing people, you know, uh, arrested. We've had, today we hit a mark of 10,000 people who have been arrested during, during demonstrations and protests. And well, I'm glad you're bringing that up because, um, of course, it's not merely what, what people do for themselves, but what is done to them. And in a time that we would like to de-incarcerate, to uh, decompress um, uh, penal institutions, uh, let people leave who uh, can safely be let go. Uh, now we're reincarcerating on um, what is sometimes a, a trivial issue. I mean, some people getting whacked on the head and arrested just for standing there. Now, if there is looting or violence, of course, uh, one can expect to get arrested, but. Um, there are many people who are being rounded up who are, uh, I think, not, it, it's not indicated that they'd be incarcerated. And, uh, and uh, this is an unfortunate uh, uh, lack of judgment, I think, on the part of some of the police. Yeah. I, I know in San Francisco last night, they were arresting people for curfew breakages uh, quite a lot. And that, that, that carries weight in any time. You know, you can theoretically say you're, you're, you're infringing on someone's rights. But right now, you're actually telling them that they might have an increased risk of, you know, getting a disease because they were out after 7 p.m. Um, sorry, I'm talking too much. Mayor, what, what, what do you make of all this? Is there a way to do this safely and to address this, these systemic issues that are being protested while um, not making the pandemic worse than it needs to be? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I really, I think you've touched on um, all of the, the, the right points. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a balance between people's, uh, wa people wanting to go out and have their voice heard and to express the outrage that we all feel while trying to balance safety. And so um, I, I'm having these same conversations in my own home. Uh, my kids and I want to be able to go out and uh, uh, demonstrate here in our local area in Connecticut, uh, uh, but we have to think about the safety issues. We have uh, elderly grandparents in the home. We have all of these kinds of competing interests, and uh, everyone's facing that, and, and we have to try to make the best judgments that we can uh, and be as safe as we can, and it is, we definitely see a wide variety of of uh, practices. So there are definitely some areas that you pointed out that uh, where masks are being used with a greater fidelity, but there are images uh, from many other parts of the country where you just don't see the same level of, of, of uh, uh, safety being adhered to. And so uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's an important uh, challenge that we're all facing. Right. Um, I should note that if anyone is, is watching this live and would like to drop a comment in there, in there we can take questions, we'll do our best with them. Um, just, just drop it in there, that would be great. Um, we set out to talk about education, uh, public health education. And um, so I want to, first starting more, more broadly, is this moment of awareness, I mean, I, I'm hearing a lot of people talking about realizing racism is a public health issue for the first time now, even though people have been, you know, the World Health Organization's constitution says health needs to be distributed equitably regardless of race from 1946. And people have been studying this since the 60s and 70s, but uh, it's an awakening for a lot of people um, that, that the, the system of mass incarceration and, and the, um, racial violence and um, racism of all sorts is, bears on public health. Do you think this will change, um, you know, the nature of public health education more broadly, or the way 
Yale specifically is thinking about it? And uh, wh whoever would like to go first on this. Great. Uh, I mean, I can I can jump in. I mean, I think uh, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we've done a very good job for quite some time now in documenting uh, what people might refer to as disparities by race and by other factors. But what we need to do is move from merely documenting and understanding those uh, disparities and moving into a framework where we're really talking about health inequities. These are uh, these are issues that come from systemic long-standing problems in our society that we all that we know all too well and so we need to not only think about the problems but what are the solutions and I think increasingly public health education is moving in that direction um, uh, 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 as uh, some of our viewers may know, the um, School of Public Health is uh, launching a new concentration focused on health justice and health equity. Um, and I'd be happy to chat with, uh, about some of the elements of that new concentration, but we have a new concentration in uh, climate change and uh, health, which uh, bears directly on issues of equity. And so, and these were uh, developed pre-COVID, um, and so, uh, but I think these are the kinds of directions, giving our students the tools to not only understand problems, but to try to work towards solutions, activism um, uh, uh, to be, and, and activism to be able to uh, make meaningful change. Yeah, it feels like maybe we're reaching, as, as an academic discipline in terms of documenting and studying these problems, we've seen them for so long, that it, maybe there's a bit of a seat, a movement in the field to move toward, okay, we, we need to do things now and change policies more actively because continuing to study is still important, but um, it, th there's, there's a, 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 it's a point after which um, the field grows and becomes more hands-on. Is that, is that accurate or has it always been this way? No, you're, you're right. Uh, we started about a year and a half ago the um, Center for um, Implementation and Prevention Science Methods because we wanted to um, be able to um, marshal research that actually assessed uh, interventions in real world conditions and whether they worked or didn't work. And if they didn't work, what how they might be pivoted to be improved. And um, that was a very con conscious decision on the part of myself and the faculty to increase the opportunities for active investigation to change things rather than simply to observe things. Um, we've doubled the size of our Office of Public Health Practice uh, and increased the options for our students to um, engage programs uh, with the homeless, programs with the food insecure, programs in the, um, with the Department of Correction in the state, um, uh, programs uh, in the LGBT community, programs in the New Haven community, and on and on. Um, we've also um, expanded, as Mayur just said, our um, um, repertoire in uh, social justice, including a an emphasis area, a new core course in that topic. And uh, if we become the Yale School of Public Health, uh, parentheses, social justice, it'd be fine with me because ultimately the, um, the lack of access to healthcare, the uh, lack of access to healthy food options, the lack of um, access to optimized educational opportunities, um, on and on, um, the health challenges of the US are due to inequities and the um, inability to access uh, the best that the US has to offer. The, U the, the European democracies are much more ho homogeneous uh, in the services offered. Uh, you go to countries in Europe and the worst school in the city and the best school in the city are not that different. Uh, and uh, you also look at the worst neighborhood in the city and the best neighborhoods in the city, and sure they're different, but nowhere near the drama 
uh, that we see in a typical city in the U.S. Nowhere near as extreme. Um, and uh, most uh, um, uh, food insecurity is a rare phenomenon in the, the European democracy. So we spend more money for health care than any of the 32 countries that are considered high income countries in the um, Organization of Economic uh, Development Cooperation, OECD, and um, Cooperation Development. And, and we rank dead last, dead last, be behind Slovenia and Slovakia, we are bet dead last in, um, in outcomes. And it's all because uh, if you're sick and you have health insurance, uh, you will do well in America because we've got such an excellent health system in, in the sense of just curative care. But if you want to avoid getting sick or if you don't have health insurance or you have low income, uh, you will do better at any of those other 31 countries because they do much better with social services and with preventive services than we do. And so paying uh, twice as much to get worse outcomes I would like to think that uh, the American political and business communities would like to change that with us. It seems clear to me, you, you, you bring a physician's perspective to public health and you have a, a lens that is both in the sort of um, studies of public health phenomena and then actually the practice of implementing change. Um, I'm wondering if either of you have seen a, a change, the, the school is clearly reorienting and adding uh, new offerings and um, expanding to accommodate more practice-based um, faculty and education. Uh, do you see, have you seen a change in the years over students who are, what, what people are going into public health for and wanting out of education in terms of just wanting, wanting to understand and document problems and um, publish paper on that or wanting to do that and also activate and change systems? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, if I could just jump in, I mean, I think that is actually a great point. Uh, and to really highlight that, I'd say that uh, the idea of this new concentration that's focused in health justice was uh, born from the students. So uh, in the last couple of years, we've had students increasingly say, we want to not only study public health as it's been traditionally done, but we want concrete skills uh, to be able to affect the change that we want to be able to go into. And so we see students going into those kinds of roles. And so as a result of that, this concentration is now going to offer uh, courses in health activism and advocacy, for example, that'll lay out the uh, theoretical underpinnings and frameworks, but also uh, practical applications for this kind of work. Also a second course in critical public health analysis. And so uh, these kinds of things have really come from the students and, and the concentration has been developed in collaboration with students and faculty. And so I think it's exactly uh, what you're saying, James, is that we see students wanting to be able to go into more of those kinds of jobs uh, and to be able to affect that kind of change. And so this is uh, uh, so critical for our, our education endeavor. This is probably a good time to jump in with the theme of health communication. So something that I have noticed for years now, and uh, most acutely, I think, since the Trump administration came in, into power, is that we in the public health field must improve our ability to communicate the evidence base for prevention. We have to communicate that to lay audiences that are voters um, who have a local influence in their uh, governments and clubs and uh, businesses and schools and arts organizations, et cetera. Uh, and we have to communicate it to policymakers, whether elected or unelected, people who are disproportionately influential in deciding what policies go forward. And when we do not succeed, the stakes can be quite terrible. So take the COVID-19 circumstance. Um, 25 years ago, Laurie Garrett published The Coming Plague. It was a bestseller and uh, was crystal clear as to the risk of global pandemics. 
Um, Tony Fauci has sung the 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 siren song of 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 threat of pandemics every year that I've known him, and I've known him for 40 years. Um, the CDC published an update to its um, pandemic influenza plan in 2017, including community guidance in 2017. Um, there, I did a literature search just the other day on pandemic respiratory viruses, and there were over 300 review articles. There were thousands of original articles. There were over 300 review articles on that exact subject. So we've known this for decades, and we've known it since 1918, another pandemic in 1957, another one in 1968, another one in 2009. So we had the, we had the wake up call with SARS in 2003 and four with MERS, the Middle Eastern uh, version of SARS in uh, uh, 2014 to the, just, just up to last year. They've had cases every year for five, six years. So the reality is that this is not a surprise. And yet we didn't have N95 masks. We didn't have surge capacity for our ICUs. We didn't have ventilators in adequate supply. We didn't have anything prepared. And uh, the Chinese shut their epidemic down much faster than we've done because in fact, they had done a lot more preparation after SARS. And uh, they were in a position to do more surge work. They were in a position to respond with greater aggressiveness. And who knows if they hadn't had political interference in, in December, if they wouldn't have um, uh, shut it down even faster. Uh, the South Koreans were very well prepared. The Taiwanese were very well prepared. So uh, the, the, the New Zealanders, I mean, there are many groups paid attention to this and were prepared. And the United States is the worst pandemic uh, in the world, the worst case rates, the worst death rates, uh, because we were among the least prepared. And um, maybe, we, I, people like myself have failed. We've not taught our generation of students how to communicate. We ourselves have failed in communication. So your course, James, is a direct response to try to address this issue. Uh, we are negotiating with a, a physician with a master of public health degree whose primary job is to write scripts for Hollywood and television and was one of the principal writers for the, for the program ER. And Neil Baer is his name, and we hope to have him on the faculty in the very near future. And he's going to help us how to communicate using mass media, social media, and the like um, more effectively to reach people about the value about, of vaccines, the value of preparedness, the value of prevention, rather than head, ostrich head in the sand, approaches, and now we're investing $8 trillion for a bailout. Right, right. Uh, yeah, it's definitely an academic area I'm very interested in. There, there are people who have laid out exactly how and why people change behaviors and change beliefs and what are effective ways of communication and what are not. And um, it's something yet that is so much, so many academic areas is not seen, taken as a serious pursuit as something to do in your spare time, um, if at all. And so, but I know you value this also, Mayor. Yeah, no, and I would just add, I mean, those are absolutely right. I mean, uh, I'm glad Stan mentioned your own course, which has been uh, tremendously popular in terms of helping students understand how to navigate social media, new media, and, and uh, getting out uh, health messaging in a way that is uh, effective. Uh, and even more of our courses. So we do a good job of training students in writing academic papers and in policy briefs. The times, again, the sort of more traditional ways in which we've uh, trained students to do that. But a lot of the new courses that we're developing and, and existing courses are incorporating more elements of uh, op-ed writing, of even doing things like training in how to do effective legislative uh, testimony uh, all of the kinds of things that will help to speak to, to vast audiences. So from everything from social media and reaching the public to policymakers, as Sten was saying, in the way of, of, of legislative testimony, which has its own style of communication and, and uh, means for being effective. And so we need to be thinking about all of the various ways in which we're training students to be uh, effective communicators uh, in whatever sphere they go into. Yeah, yeah. No, that's the key that I'm finding in my course, too, is you know, during a master's period, 
people are not going to be trained in every mode and not everyone is going to testify and write scientific papers and policy briefs and long form journalism and op-eds and do every social media platform. But you, you know, it's during that period of study is a great time to identify what do you really care about? What issues exactly. do you want to study and change and what are the effective platforms on which you can communicate? And then I, you know, I hope at the end of my course, people leave with a concrete plan about what they're doing here, why they're using this particular platform and who they want to reach and what the issue is. Um, and just being evidence-based about it in the, in the clinical way. We have one question here from a viewer, which I'd like to take, and then uh, we, should, we should close, um, uh, even though I'd love to keep talking to both of you all, all afternoon. Um, how far could public health go under a capitalist system as a means for common good? Isn't public health inherently conflicting with capitalism? That's a big question to end on. I, I think also too, just or, or just political alliances too. You know, you mentioned the term social justice, and that that is already something that's become sort of a um, good wedge term somehow. Even though you'd think people would want justice, um, and so so yeah, I do I do wonder sometimes how do you right. reach people who might think that you are inherently coming from a certain political position or that you're anti-capitalist, etc. So definitions of communism, capitalism um, may be uh, less clear than uh, people appreciate. Uh, some of the greenest economies in the world that pollute the least, that um, are the most equitable, that have the lowest Gini coefficient, some of you have heard of Gini, the famous economist who created the Gini coefficient, looking at, at economic disparities, are actually the small Northern European democracies, places like the Netherlands, the Scandinavian countries, and the like. And um, in those countries, something like 80, 90% of the means of production are in private hands. However, they are termed sometimes um, uh, social, social, social democracies. The social part is socialism to an extent that blunts the differences between the poorest and the richest, brings the poorest up a bit, brings the richest down a bit, and the Gini coefficients are therefore minimized. And uh, by no means are they um, not capitalist. They're absolutely capitalist, but they've been substantially modulated for um, social good. And um, some of the worst pollution I've ever seen in my life has been in the so-called communist countries. And the most harmful living conditions, I'm a pediatrician in my first life, for children in these environments. So I don't think it maps clearly that uh, social good and, and public welfare better uh, in uh, uh, non-capitalist and worst in capitalist. It's more nuanced and complex than that. But what I would like to say is that there's a huge difference in different societies and also political systems around the balance of individual liberty versus social obligation. And uh, in those um, European democracies I was alluding to, there's a much stronger sense that uh, uh, you need to you need to rein in your personal behavior on behalf of the society. Uh, gun uh, 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 policy is a good example. Lots of gun ownership in Scandinavia, lots of hunters, but very uh, rigid and uh, firm rules on purchasing guns. No assault weapons. Uh, no no you know. Um, uh, uh, semi-automatic rifles. If you can't use it for hunting, then it's discouraged. And gun safety must be locked up, etc. Um, so gun ownership is not in impeded, but gun safety is maximized. Um, and that is the trade-off between the so-called individual right to do whatever I want with whatever gun I want versus the social good. And you see time and time again the U.S. being biased towards the individual and many of our counterpart democracies being more, more central when they are considering social good. And I, as a public health professional, I'm actually very sympathetic to those societies that have asked 
for more social responsibility with a very modest sacrifice of so-called personal liberty. I think that's a reasonable trade-off. Very well stated. Mayor, did you have, have thoughts on that or anything else you want to come back to in closing? Yeah, no, I mean, I would just say, I mean, that, I think that's, you know, Stan covered a lot of ground there. Um, and uh, absolutely right. Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot that we need to do. There's a lot that we can do given the current situation that we're in. We have the means and the tools uh, to make substantial change if we have the will. Uh, and we just need to get uh, things done. We need to do better. Um, and over time, we'll be able to see uh, broader uh, change maybe in some of our, our sort of these larger systems. But I, there's so much that we can do um, right now that can help improve the lives of, 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 of everyone. Uh, and that's what we need to stay focused on. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think some of these political valences that we see right now imposed on ideas of public health only come when you have say what one party simply won't acknowledge or do anything toward climate change but in a more typical spectrum of, of capitalism and communism ideas there's you, most of public health is designed to enable people to make individual choices it's this mix of individualism and collectivism that uh, i know that's part of what drew me to it and i know there's a diverse diverse array of thoughts and perspectives and um, within the academic community and um i could go on about that and i'd love to i should wrap it here uh thank you both so much for joining uh the show today and um we will be joining again next week thank you Take very care. much james thanks